Uh, can you hear me now? Wonderful. All right, welcome everybody to the, um, to the uh, uh, I think we're on the fifth of our 40 minutes of confidence series. And today's problem involved uh, talking about sound isolation between two rooms, or actually I think it was actually between uh, the inside and the outside safe principle. And generally, uh, if you see it on the exam or if you hear architects talking to each other, they're often using a wall as an example uh, of how to keep sound out from one space to another. But you should keep in mind as we go through this, and fr frankly, in the exam, it'll be like this, and it, it's good, good kind of shortcut, but know that as an acoustical consultant, and I was one for years, um, and still do on occasion consult in that, in that field, uh, it's often the floor ceiling assembly that's the culprit or that's the weak point. All right, so moving forward, we know that we have wall A and it has a sound transmission loss of 60 in the op opaque portion and 5% of the surface of the wall is covered by window and the window has a TL of 25 and TL means transmission loss. Wall B, this other wall uh, that we're considering has a sound transmission loss of 40, so it's less robust. You remember that wall A has a sound transmission loss of 60 and B is 40. Um, but there is no window in wall B, so the entire uh, surface is, 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 uh, um, is, uh, uh, is opaque. So the question is, which will do a better job keeping the passing bus noise out of the apartment, wall A or wall B? All right, now um, there are lots of ways to calculate this, there are surely formulas, but this is, uh, um, this is a, a table that is uh, in Mead and, and Mead rather, mechanical and electrical equipment for buildings. And uh, tables and drawings like this in Mead are pretty fair game for the exam. And they're definitely the kind of thing that you should be on the lookout for. And so what we're saying is we have a, um, uh, we have a uh, wall here um, for wall A, and it has a transmission loss of 60 decibels. And we're gonna to get to what transmission loss is in a minute, but transmission loss is a number, the higher the number, the more robust the wall is at keeping out sound. And uh, it's about 95% of the wall is this opaque uh, transmission loss 60 uh, element or assembly. And then for wall B, I'm sorry, then for also for wall A, there's this window and this window is 5% and the window has a transmission loss of 25 decibels, so it's less robust, and that's pretty typical, and that's not surprising. Um, and then for wall B, we have the wall, but the whole whole wall, all 100%, is 40. So the question is, which wall will outperform which? And you could probably guess it's going to be wall B because I have a point, <laughs> and um, but we'll we'll kind of figure this out. So. What this chart is, what this nomograph is, actually pretty handy and it's pretty nifty, but it's not particularly um, intuitive to use at first. And that's why I wanted to go over it. And it could be found on the exam. So uh, we have on the x-axis, we have transmission loss one minus transmission loss two. Well, transmission loss one is this number right here. So we can kind of take that over and it's 60. And transmission loss two is this number right here. It's 40. And we'll take one minus, I'm sorry, that's not true at all. <laughs> transmission loss one is 60, is the transmission loss of the 60. And all of this is just about this first wall. So the first one we're gonna do is just the first wall. So this wall A. So transmission loss two is this number here. It's the number um, of the transmission loss for the window. So that's gonna go over here, we'll take that away. And so it's gonna be 25. So 60 minus 25 is transmission loss one minus transmission loss two, and that's equal to 35. So we can start right here at 35 and we can start to move up. Now, as always, I don't want you to just think of it as 60 minus 35, okay, it's 25. You need to ask yourself anytime you see a number like this, say, okay, if that number gets bigger, what does that mean? Well, if that number gets bigger, that means there's a bigger difference between the opaque portion of the wall and the transparent portion of the wall, or between the robust portion of the wall and the less robust portion of the wall. 
So the bigger that number, the, the, um, uh, the, you know, a big number means you have an amazing wall and a crappy window. And a small number means you have a so-so wall and a really robust window. All right, so we're gonna start at 35 and we're gonna move up, 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 until we get to this point here, which is at five. And that five is a percent of the total area having the second transmission loss. So it's this 5% right here is the area of the window. And again, don't just look at it as a five. Recognize that this means 1% and this means 100% and um, this means 10% and so forth. So what we wanna look at is we wanna say, okay, um, where, how much of the, what's the difference between the window and the wall? And then what's the, um, what's the percentage of the wall that is window? And that gets us to there. Then we're gonna go straight across. And when we go straight across, we see we're at 22. So what does 22 mean? Well, 22 is transmission loss one minus the transmission loss composite. And the composite is what we're trying to figure out. How well does this wall perform as a composite? What's the transmission loss given that most of it is transmission loss of 60 and a portion of it is transmission loss of 25. So transmission loss one is this number here, 60. And transmission loss composite, that's what the new one is. That's what we're trying to find out. And we see that it's equal to 22. And so what we can do is we can bring the transmission loss on the other side and say that 60 equals transmission loss composite plus 22. And we can subtract 22 from both sides. And we see that the transmission loss composite is equal to 38. Now, two things with that. Again, don't just look at that as a number. What does that mean? What it means is that the new transmission loss of this wall, that's 95% opaque with a transmission loss of 60, and 5% uh, transparent with a transmission loss of 25, the composite for the whole thing is going to be a transmission loss of 38. So first of all, you see that 38, given that only 5% of the wall is window, you see that that 38 had a significant impact on that 60 decibels. It brought it way closer to the 25 than it is to 60, given that only 5% of the wall is window. But secondly, when you're looking at this thing here, know that you don't have to kind of work this all out. Really what we're saying is this number on the y-axis is the difference between the robust part of the wall and the total wall. So we could just take 60, which is what we started with, and recognize that we just lost 22. That's how much we lost, right? So when we're talking about uh, keeping sound out, when we're talking about noise isolation, uh, when we're talking about transmission loss and sound transmission class, and I'll explain the difference in a second between them, what we're really talking about is we're talking about uh, uh, assemblies that are massive and that are airtight and that are structurally discontinuous. Massive, airtight, and structurally discontinuous. All right, so, hold on, I'm gonna, okay, yeah. All right, so what does that mean? Um, well, it means that two layers of gypsum board is better than one because two layers of gypsum board is more massive. And it means it's also better because you can stagger the seams. And because we can stagger the seams, we can make it more airtight. Likewise, uh, if, we if we fill our uh, CMU with, CMU has a pretty good, uh, pretty good profile in terms of its ability to keep sound out, but ground fill CMU does a lot better, especially in low frequencies where you have a, say a mechanical room on one side and a classroom on the other. So we can make it more massive, we can do better. Like structurally discontinuous, there's several ways to get that, but one is to have two layers. So two layers, often with a sound absorbing layer in between, but that's not as important as you might think. A lot of people really focus on this thing. And that's worthwhile, but it's kind of like tip and tax. It's part of the meal when you think about how expensive the meal is, 
but it's not a dominant part. Um, or it's about how fast you're running with shoes that are new or, or you know, or um, the fact that you've hydrated well. It's important, but not as important as just how fast you are in general. Likewise, if we're talking about uh, structural discontinuity, we can use resilient channels. So we can have channels like that look like this or kind of uh, thin gauge metal. And if you have wood studs, you can make essentially the assembly more floppy and you can structurally disconnect one side of the um, one side of the gypsum, ball, gypsum board uh, from the structure. All right, and then in terms of air tightness, if we have, say, electrical receptacles, we would like them to be uh, uh, on opposite sides of a stud because that way there's something, there's a barrier and it's more airtight. So if they stay in the same barrier, uh, if they stay in the same cavity, then there's, that's where the sound's gonna come through. And actually, that turns out in general, again, the, the exam and architects like to talk about the wall, but it's really the gap in the wall or the crack or the window or the door that's gonna dominate where sound, where sound moves in reality. So, and it's true, of course, the architect has more, probably more control over, um, probably has more control over the assembly of the wall than they do how much is gonna, you know, how much caulk needs, is gonna actually be applied there by the contractor. But, um, but the architect does have a lot of control over what room is next to what room. So if you have a loud room, like a mechanical room, uh, or a gymnasium or a you know, weight room or something like that, and you have quiet rooms in your space, like a, a conference room, by not putting those next to each other, you're doing the single most important thing you can do to keep air horn noise out. Much more important than the wall you pick is actually the space planning. But let's assume we have a wall and, and, and we've kind of done with that. And you know, we've already decided what the adjacency is gonna be. And so it's gonna be what comes out through the transfer ducts and vents um, what comes out through the doors, underneath the doors. Um, it's gonna be about what comes out through pipe penetrations, through data jacks, through electrical receptacles, through niches for things like bookshelves and attachments for things like um, wall-mounted TVs, through the seams where the, where the ceiling meets the wall and where the wall meets the floor, um, and uh, uh, out one window and back through another window through penetrations for ducts and so on. So it turns out it's actually gonna be much more important, especially for a critical adjacency, it's gonna be much more important uh, how the contractor built it um, than, uh, than what you specify in terms of the wall assembly. Now, if we're talking about just the wall assembly, and that's really what this problem talks about, uh, what we wanna think about is we wanna think, okay, there's sound that's gonna uh, impinge, upon a, impinge upon a surface, that surface in our case is a wall, some of it will be reflected in a specular way where the angle of reflection, um, this, angle, this angle here, or angle of incidence, this angle here, is equal to the angle of reflection. Some of it is gonna be diffused, where especially on a bumpy surface, where some of the sound is gonna kinda of go every which way. Some of it is gonna be absorbed by the um, by the surface of the uh, by the surface of the wall, and actually, this um, diagram makes it look like it's the core of the wall that's absorbing it. But in general, um, it's more about what the surface is. So, is it smooth? Is it uh, rough? Is it porous? Is it uh, is it hard? And finally, some of it's going to move through, and that's the part we're most concerned of here. Now, what we're talking about is we're saying, okay. We have a source room and you know maybe there's some kind of bumping music going on or or maybe there's a, a, a some kind of equipment that's grinding away and there's a certain level of noise in the source room and then there's a less noise in the receiving room now most of the difference most of the what's called the noise reduction between the source room up here and, and incidentally all of these drawings all these illustrations are from my book it's called architectural acoustics illustrated um it's kind of like a ching book but for acoustics and um, uh, 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 we, have a, uh, we have the difference between the source room and the receiving room, that's gonna be the noise reduction. And that's really what we're interested in. Now, what the noise reduction is, is it's a function of three things. It's a function of how robust the wall is, that's the transmission loss of the wall, what the wall is made of. But it's also a function of two other things. One is uh, the total surface area of the wall, because if these two rooms 
shared only, you know, a couple inches of common wall because they were kind of staggered in plan. You know, if you plan, you had the noisy room here and you had the quiet room here. Because there's only this small amount of overlap, you can imagine that there would be less noise passing through. It's also a function of how absorbent the receiving room is. You can imagine if the receiving room had fuzz everywhere, then when the noise went through, uh, less of it would kind of linger around. So when I have my equipment groaning away in this room, uh, in this room, if, there's, if the receiving room is very absorbent, once it goes through, it's gonna kind of die quickly. If the receiving room is reverberant like a racquetball court, once it goes through, it's gonna stay loud for a while. All right. So the, um, it turns out that the surface area that's in common and the receiving room absorption really aren't that important. Again, that's, that's more about how, you know, how good are your shoes and how much did you hydrate last night. The main thing, which is how much have you trained and how fast are you, is in the transmission loss. It's in how robust the actual barrier is, how robust is the wall, how massive is it, how airtight is it, and how structurally discontinuous is it. That's really what we're talking about. Sure, you can get something at the margins by hydrating and by uh, using good shoes, but most of it is going to be about how much you trained and just how fast you are. Now, transmission loss itself is not a single number, despite the problem I gave you that kind of almost implies that it is. You remember that the opaque portion of our uh, wall A was 60 and the opaque portion of our wall B was 40, and it was a transmission loss. Now, in reality, the transmission loss is measured. Um, it's based on, uh, and a higher number again is more robust. Um, the transmission loss is measured at every octave band. It's actually measured at every frequency, but we kind of group them together in octave bands. And so we measure frequency by hertz and we uh, denote our octave bands, which are these kind of groupings of hertz, by their center frequency. So we have 125 hertz, 250 hertz, and so forth, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 and 4000. 125 hertz are its low frequency and 4000 hertz is high frequency. 125 hertz is low tones, rumble, rumbles and groans, and 4000 hertz is high tones, hisses and beeps. And so you'll note that we have a transmission loss value for each of these two walls. The fourth, first is a normative stud wall, and the second is a double stud wall, stud wall with two layers of wallboard on each side and glass fiber in the cavity, cavity. So the second wall is obviously more robust. It's a double stud configuration with uh, insulation in the cavity and two uh, layers of gypsum board on each side. Now, if we're most concerned with the mechanical noise from the mechanical room next, next door, the equipment next door, if we're most concerned with bus noise like our problem was assigned or if we're most concerned with um, uh, electronic sound reinforcement, like if there's a club next door and they're playing EDM music, then we're really concerned with kind of down here in 125 hertz and 250 hertz. If we're talking about speech, we're more concerned with kind of 500 to 4,000 hertz. Although of course there are exceptions and kind of shoulder conditions on both of those. And within speech, 500 and 250 and 500 hertz is kind of the vowels, and 2,000 and 4,000 hertz is kind of the consonants. And it's the consonants that are most important in terms of speech intelligibility. So if your goal is to make sure that the person in the next office can't hear you, understand what you're saying, because you have a goal of, say, speech security, because you're working on something that involves kind of terrorism, then you really do want to focus up here. And if your goal is to kind of generally keep out speech from one office to another, you generally want to kind of focus here in the middle frequencies. And if you have an issue, if you have an issue with electronic sound reinforcement, mechanical equipment, or transportation noise like an airplane or a bus, um, then you're talking mostly about kind of the low frequencies. And it turns out that in general, um, low frequencies are way more difficult uh, for a barrier to um, to intercept at high frequencies. That's why if you are going down the street and you hear a boom car, you can hear its low frequency thumping and you just assume that the person driving it is listening to just bass. But once they open the door, you can hear a melody and you can hear lyrics. That's because once they open the door, these higher frequencies are allowed to come out. Um, but when they close the door, 
uh, the higher frequencies are kept out and the lower frequencies are still passing through. So it takes something really robust to keep out the low frequencies. And so you can see here, let me go ahead and erase. Um, all right, oops. All right, you can see here that um, at uh, 4,000 Hertz, the normative wall is 41 transmission loss and the, um, and the, uh, um, the robust wall has a transmission loss of 65. And that means at high pitches, the robust wall does 20 decibels better uh, than, the low, than the low frequency. Nominally, that's what that means. Um, you can't see because I just put my red thing over it and I can't find the eraser uh, icon. Um, but here it was 40. So again, uh, that's kind of our, our low grade wall is 40. And our good wall, which we have a 60, but this one happens to be 65 at 1,000 hertz. And generally, 1,000 hertz is a good kind of proxy for discussing what's going on. And so back to kind of the running analogy, um, what you might consider is you might say, OK, um, you may know someone who's a runner, and you may ask yourself, are they fast? Well, are they fast kind of depends. Um, you can imagine that 125 hertz is a 40-yard uh, sprint, and 4,000 uh, 4, hertz is a marathon, and 2,000 hertz is a 5K, and 1,000 hertz is a, a 400, and uh, you know, and so forth. And so, when you ask yourself, are they fast? Some people are fast at uh, marathons, and some people are fast at sprints, and some people are fast at middle distance, and some people are fast at all three. And if you're fast at one, it's pretty likely you're fast at the ones near you, and it may be that you're fast at the other ends of the spectrum at the short distance or the long distance, but it also could be that you have a lot of slow twitch muscle fiber and endurance and you've been training a lot, whereas somebody else who hasn't been training but maybe has a lot of fast twitch much muscle fiber um, is going to be really good at, at sprinting. So you get the idea. You get the idea. Now, what we, what we would like, though, because everything I just explained to you is fairly complicated, and if you have to look at all these different octave bands for each uh, for each uh, assembly, if you have to look at the transmission loss of every octave band in each assembly, you can imagine that that gets a bit tedious when you're looking comparing walls. And sometimes you just want a single number. Is he fast? Is he fast? And that's what the sound transmission class is. Is he fast? Is this wall robust? Is it good at keeping out airborne noise? Now we're not talking about how, how effective the wall is at uh, uh, killing noise within a space. So if I clap in the space I'm in right now, you can hear that sound lingers for quite a while because even though it's a small room, it's, pretty, it's got a lot of hard surfaces in it. And that's why I sound a little bit echoey in, in here. Uh, uh, but if um, that's a different measure. That's a different measure altogether. That's, that's, that's about these guys on this side. We're talking about this one on this side. So if we're talking about how robust the wall is, we're talking about how much sound goes through the wall not how much sound the, the, is absorbed by the wall on the source side of the wall. We're talking about how much goes through. Likewise, we're not talking about impact noise. So if this were a floor ceiling assembly, walls that are really good at keeping airborne sound out are, are, may or may not be good at keeping structure-borne sound out. And specifically, I'm talking about footfall. So impact noise as a measurement um, is really talking about how good we are at keeping uh, the people walking above us from bothering us down below. Now, back to sound transmission class. How is it calculated? Is it the average? No, it's not the average across all the different octave bands. It's not, you don't get 62 by averaging all the different octave bands that go into it. What you get is, it's actually way more complex than I'm gonna explain here. It's, 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 it's actually not that complex, it's very complicated. But there's a weighting system and, and then there's a, some other kind of catch-alls and you put it through this really complex spreadsheet or you can do it graphically on a graph and you come up with a single number and that single number is weighted. The sound transmission class is a weighted single number. So maybe um, you're looking for a midfielder for your soccer team. So you want someone who's really good in middle distances because they have to be able to run you know, down the field pretty fast. Um, but it wouldn't be bad to have someone who was really fast in a sprint because uh, so that it's a little helpful if they're fast in a sprint because you want them to be able to uh, outrun their, their, their opponent. And you also want someone who's pretty good in a marathon or at least a half marathon 
because they're going to have to run maybe eight miles during the game. Uh, but most importantly, you want someone who's really good in the middle distances. So we're going to kind of combine the middle distances with the, 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 fat, the sprints and the, and the distances, the long distances, but we're not going to count the sprints and the long distances quite as much in our weighting when we come up with a single number. That's what this is. So sound transmission class is really good at the middle frequencies. Uh, it's not as good at low frequencies. So if you have transmission, uh, transportation noise, mechanical noise, or uh, transportation noise, mechanical noise, or, um, or uh, electronic sound reinforcement, really the sound transmission class is a pretty incomplete measure because it's not telling you how good you are at sprinting. It's only telling you, mainly telling you how good you are at middle distance and you really need a sprinter in that situation. So we see that the normative stud wall has a sound transmission class of 34, that the double layer stud wall that's robust and has a sound transmission class of 62. And just keep those numbers in mind generally, just for your own knowledge. If you do almost nothing, you can get to 35, and you have to do a lot, and then you can get to like 62. And that's a pretty good way to kind of normalize it in your head. And so what we have is we have these requirements. We have, uh, 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 we have um, uh, goals, and we have norms, and we have uh, 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 specifications. And so if we have a room uh, like a kitchen um, that really is not gonna be that quiet, uh, we're okay with it being louder in there. So maybe our goal is to have no worse than an SDC 40, 40 or better, right? Um, if we have a classroom, then maybe our uh, classroom to classroom, our SDC goal may be 50 or above. If we have a hotel room to a hotel room, uh, maybe we need SDC 55 or above. And if we have like a noisy mechanical room, um, that's next to a, um, that's next to a say a conference room or a music practice room. Uh, we want to have XTC 60 or above, so that can give, give you kind of a sense. 30 is by doing nothing. Um, 60 is by doing a lot, or 62 is by doing a lot, and 60 or above is what we need for a mechanical room. But in, interestingly, this might not be the best thing for a mechanical room because it only has uh, it only does so well at the low frequencies and the mechanical noise is not captured, you'll remember, in the SDC. But an SDC is a good place to start. All right. So if we're looking at different stud walls, and I know some of this content is actually in the Amber book. I think it's just worth looking at it again. Um, if we're looking at stud walls, it, we can see on this, uh, on this page the values for 125 hertz or 500 hertz for a given wall assembly. But right now we'll just look at the SDC and I put the SDC graphically on this continuum and you can see that a normative stud wall is 34. If we put insulation in, it turns out the insulation, as I mentioned before, really doesn't do that much until you have something that's structurally discontinuous. And because this is a wood stud wall, the insulation hasn't really helped us and it's still an SDC of, 60, of 34. We add a uh, resilient channel, a kind of floppy piece of metal, now we've made it more structurally discontinuous and we're up to 40. Now we can add insulation now that it's structurally discontinuous and we can do better. Uh, we can get to 46 with the stud wall with the um, uh, uh, resilient channel. And if we had two layers of, in, of gypsum board on both sides, so we're significantly increasing the mass, we can get up to 59. And again, these aren't numbers as abstractions. Again, 34 is doing nothing, 60 is doing a lot. That's kind of something to keep in mind. Likewise, we can do better and better as we use staggered studs and as we insulate the staggered studs and put more, uh, more, more gypsum board on both sides, we can get up to 56 from our baseline of 34. Likewise, if we have double studs, now we're talking. So this is my recommendation if you're doing a hotel right now or apartments, this is my recommendation if it's wood construction, two layers of gypsum board on both sides, um, bat insulation in the cavity and a double stud wall if you're, not, if you're not able to use concrete block or concrete. And so now we can get up to 67 up from 34 and everything in between. Now if we're looking at glass, um, glass is uh, of course a weak link and we saw in our case our, SDC, our transmission loss was like 25 so it was something like that. So we were looking at a kind of a condition depending on what octave band we're looking at where we're looking at a condition where 
we're talking about just kind of a normative single piece of glass. And as we have multiple panes of glass and or laminated glass or multiple panes of laminated glass or multiple panes of laminated glass with a big airspace between them, we can bring that SDC 26 all the way up to SDC 48. So that's pretty robust. But again, the frame becomes important as well. We need to make sure that it doesn't sit, slip through. Doors, same thing. It's not about the wall, it's about the door in your practice. In the exam, it's gonna be more about the wall, but in your practice, it's more about the door. Um, so um, if you have a louver door, you have an SDC of 12, and you know now that 12 is crap. Um, and if we have a, uh, a steel door uh, with gaskets and a drop seal, we get up to SDC of 38. And that's still kind of crap, but it's a whole lot better it's a whole lot better than, um, uh, than, than 12 uh, or 19 for a hollow core door. And so what we're doing here by increasing the, the SDC of the door, we're effectively uh, reducing the, um, the number that we looked at originally on the x-axis, the one that was the difference between the transmission loss of the robust portion of the wall and the transmission, part, uh, transmission loss in the anemic part of the wall, because we're increasing the transmission loss in the anemic part of the wall. If we, better than a door, better than one good door, frankly, is two bad doors. Uh, so having two bad doors is better than one good door if you have a vestibule in between them. Uh, don't wanna have louvers in your doors, and we don't wanna have windows in our doors, but if we're gonna have windows in our doors, vision lights, uh, we wanna make sure that we have a double pane if it's a, if it's a sensitive adjacency. Again, this is why you need to, when you're laying out your rooms, you need to be thinking about this stuff right from the beginning. Because um, once you kind of set out your adjacencies, most of the problems that you're gonna have acoustically are already, you know, from, from a, a noise isolation point of view, are already baked in. And the things you're gonna do afterward really are not as important. Because if there's no, if that, if that door is, is between uh, a noisy space and a quiet space, it really doesn't matter um, how effective it, you know, how robust, you, you don't have to make it that robust. The problem is when it's between a noisy space and a, and a quiet space, not between a quiet space and a quiet space. I think I misspoke there, but I think you understand what I meant. Um, you need to have seals around the doors. So thresholds and neoprene gaskets do better um, uh, than, than just having a big gap. A small gap is better than a big gap and a sealed gap is better than a small gap. And fancy drop seals, which are just what they sound like. Uh, they're little, uh, almost blades or dampers that go down when the door is closed. Um, they mechanically lower, they're even better still. And then we gotta think about the frame. And we wanna make sure it's filled with grout, uh, fiber filled, fiber filled with fiber or filled with grout. We just basically need to have a holistic point of view. Again, if this seems hard, don't put a door between a noisy space and a quiet space, you'll be good. So, and to be clear, it's not just because it was 5%. If we only had 1% of our windows, so we're back to our first problem where we started. We're ending where we began. If we start with 60, deaths, 60, trans, a 60 point transmission loss for the wall, and we have a 25 transmission loss for the door, or for the window, that's still a difference of 35. But in this example, I'm gonna say that we only have 1% of our wall, so just a teeny little window in our entire wall. But you see, even with 1%, we come over here and we get to 15. Now, what does that 15 mean? That means that we have to knock 15 points off our big number to see what the composite is. So our composite is gonna be 45. Our transmission loss composite in this example is gonna be 45. And you can see 45 is a long way from 60. Uh, and it's not that great. And, and we, we knocked our 60 all the way down to 45 with just 1% of our window being, uh, uh, being glass. All right, now, um, this is our problem for next week. You can take your phone out and take a photo of it. If you write to firms at amber-book.com, that's firms at amber-book.com, we will put you on the mailing list and then you can, uh, and then you can, um, uh, and then you can have this sent to you as well. But if you haven't, if you're not on the list or don't want to be on the list, make sure to take a picture of it because I'm not going to leave it up for long. This is our problem assignment for next Thursday, our next week's 40 minutes of competence. It says, the pressure in a city water main is 50 PSI. The pressure loss through piping, fittings, and the water meter 
can be ignored for this exercise. What is the height above the water main above which the water will not flow? It's given that H is equal to 2.3 PSI. And that you can be found the same way that we found our, um, th this, this formula can be found in the same way that we found our structures formulas. You can go to the exam and you can try it out yourself on the demonstration exam accessible through my NCARB. And you can uh, start the exam and click on references on the top and then click on plumbing and that, that formula will show up. So our question is we have water coming into the building uh, what height above that water main will the water not flow? Where when you turn on the faucet, nothing will come out. All right, so now is a chance for, uh, I'm gonna unmute you guys. Hopefully this week I won't mute me while I'm doing it. Uh, I'm gonna allow you guys to unmute yourselves and uh, you can ask me questions um, uh, in a little bit. Uh, but first I'm gonna go out uh, over a question from last week. All right, last week we said, uh, someone asked um, about, uh, about how you sign up for the actual exam. And I thought it was a good chance to just talk about who's testing with you. Now, these numbers obviously don't account for, for uh, quarantine and prometric nuts and all the crazy stuff that's going on, but it'll give you a sense as to how many people are with you, how many people are architects, and so forth. Um, uh, and NCARB keeps these stats, and these are their, these are their graphics. So uh, there are, in a given year, about 20,000 people testing. Um, not 20,000 tests, there are actually about 55,000 tests that were given last year, um, but about 20,000 uh, people taking those 55,000 tests. So there are 20,000 people in the same boat as you are. And you'll, see, you'll note that if there are 20,000 people taking 55,000 tests, that means on average, it's less, that's less than three tests per person. So on average, so that means that a lot of people, even in a given year, aren't taking all six exams, something that I am working hard to change. Um, all right, so of those 20,000 people, about 15,000 of them are testing only, and about 5,000 5, of those are currently, or at any given time, or, or any given year, are both testing and reporting their AXP experience. So they're reporting their work experience. And then, there's another 20,000 people who are just reporting their experience but not testing. So in total, there are about 20,000 people testing, there are about 25,000 people reporting their experience, and, there, and of that total of 45,000, there are about 5,000 people who are doing both. There are 115,000 architects in the US, um, and that's up a bit. Um, so uh, that's up a bit since the recession, um, uh, uh, but I don't know if it's up a bit from 2017 to 2018. So these are the number of candidates competing uh, the core licensure requirements. In other words, these are the people passing all the, who passed all the exams in a given year and, um, and have finished their AXP. So they, are, they may not be licensed yet by their board because sometimes that takes a few weeks, but they've finished everything. They're essentially, for our purposes here, we can consider them licensed. So there are about 5,000 people a year who get licensed, and that number is down about 6% from 2017 to 2018, but you see it's up pretty significantly uh, from 2013. Um, this is the number of candidates. It's pretty much, it went dipped down after the recession, but it's pretty much st stayed steady ever since. It's pretty much stayed steady since the recession. I mentioned the number of architects that are licensed. These are the people who are keeping, these other 115,315 are the ones that are keeping your fees low and your salaries low. <laughs> so if you've ever wondered why architects are not paid much, it's because this number is probably a bit higher than the market will bear. And so we are continually kind of undercutting one another uh, on price because there's an excess of supply and it's very much a buyer's market from the point of view of the owner of the building. And that number of architects has increased relative to the U.S. population. So it's not just keeping up with population growth. It's actually exceeding uh, population growth. Since 2009, population growth in the U.S. has gone up about 7%, but the number of architects has gone up by about twice that number. And again, you don't have to be a, uh, you don't have to be a math whiz to realize that if that keeps on going forever, um, we better find some uh, more 
more use for an architect, which I think we have as well. I mean, there's certainly been a lot of building in these years here as well. And that translates to about one architect for every 2,800 people. So uh, once you get licensed, uh, you'll be one out of 2,800. A few years ago, that was about one out of every 3,000 people. Now it's uh, because there are more architects relative to the number of people <coughs> in the US. Um, uh, now we're talking about um, one for every 2,800 people. All right, so I thought it was a good time. Someone asked last time, they said they didn't, they didn't specifically ask um, why, uh, how many architects are there, how many people are testing, but they asked, how do I sign up for the exams? And so here's how you're gonna sign up for the exam. You're gonna go to my NCARB, and you have a choice of the NCARB record and uh, your AXP, and uh, you click on the NCARB record, and you can see within there, you can click on tabs for your profile, um, is your password. It has what school you went to, your high school included, believe it or not. You can click on your experience and you can see what percentage of these different areas in your AXP is approved. And I know most of you guys know this, but in case you don't, you can click on your exams. We'll get back to this in a second, but you can click on your exams and from the exams you can see uh, which exams you have completed. In this case, this person has completed none and he can buy C credits by clicking on this and then it has your rolling clock you can look up registrations there are none here and there's a tab for payment so if you go back to the exams you can buy a C credit so you can click on that and then you can buy a quantity of C credits so you can buy one or two or all the way up to six and then you click on checkout and then you can pay by a third third party or by a credit card corporate account and so forth so if you are uh, hesitant, part of the reason I show you this is I want all you guys to just go on and do that. All right, now I am going to uh, unlock you guys. I'm gonna unmute you guys. So those of you who are ready to study, go study. Those of you who wanna stick around and ask a question, stick around and ask a question. And I will see you guys next week when we talk about plumbing. I cannot wait, I cannot wait to talk to you guys next week. Hi, Michael. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, I was wondering, with the acoustics, I have a couple questions. How does um, noise criteria uh, play in, in terms of like, specking the um, sound in the room? If STC is about how robust the wall is to prevent sound from coming in and absorption <clears throat> takes up that sound. Um, can you explain a little more about uh, NC? Yes, um, so noise criteria is a single number rating that describes how, target, how quiet our target room is. So basically it's this level here. How loud, how loud is our target room? Here this person's sleeping, so we might want an STC of say 25, which means we want it to be quiet. If instead this room was a kitchen, then this, then the, we may be okay if it was this loud, and that means we only have to kill this much sound. But because it's all the way down here, we know we have to kill this much sound. So the SDC comes in when we're trying to figure out, I'm sorry, the noise criteria comes in when we're trying to figure out how robust the wall has to be because we want to know how quiet the receiving room needs to be. It doesn't really show up, and that does kind of show up in the calculations, but um, I don't think that the calculations are worthwhile for someone studying for an exam. I think the calculations for reverberation time may be worthwhile to do, and I'll, I'll make sure to put that on some future uh, on the list. I have a list of 40 minutes of confidence, and you can always email me, um, or you can tell me right now, or you can write in the chat. We, 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 we have a really long list based on the chat and based on what people have asked me and based on what I know is on the exam, uh, or what I think what people tell me is needs to be covered more for the exam, uh, we have a kind of a long list of, of things. But um, the noise criteria is a, is a single number rating of how quiet the receiving room needs to be. 
Okay, and then my second question, which you just um, sort of touched on is, uh, you know, as I'm diving into all this material for PPD and PDD, there's a lot of um, formulas that are not given, um, you know, in, the, in those reference formulas for the exam. Right. And, you know, they're pertinent to understanding the material. Um, do you feel like the calculations are pretty much, they're gonna give you a formula? Yes. Or it's gonna be a reference formula? Yes. Or are there formulas you said, yeah? Yes, you don't have to memorize formulas with the exception of how many square feet are in an acre. It is crazy to me that they would expect you to know that uh, by memory, but I would memorize how many square feet are in an acre. Uh, for some reason, the test still wants you to know that one. Almost everything else, um, uh, A is not, uh, it, it, it's either not, or it's either, okay, A, they'll give you the formula, B, uh, I'm always surprised by how for how little calculations they need they they ask you. So in general, if you were just studying for the exam, you probably wouldn't focus too much on calculations because there's just not that much calculations on the exam. However, I like to focus on calculations on these 40 minutes of confidence calls because if you can do the calculation, then you can understand the rest of it. So you understand that a higher STC is better than a lower STC because we just did the calculation. And you understand, um, you understand, you can ask an intelligent question about noise criteria because we just did, well, maybe we didn't do the calculation, but we at least looked over the real numbers. So I'm a big fan of looking over the numbers, not because there's a lot of that on the exam, but because if you're at the point where you can look over the numbers and you can make sense of them and, and understand the relationship between them, you know, as this goes up, this goes down, or as this goes up, this also goes up. Um, if you can kind of readily to tell yourself those um, those relationships, uh, then you're going to be much better off on the exam for all the other questions where they're asking something like, you know, you could imagine them asking like, uh, uh, you have a wall and it has an STC of 45. Is that, you know, is that robust? I guess they probably wouldn't ask that. But yeah, is an STC wall 45, is it more robust, less robust, or the same as an STC 60 or something? Um, so if you already know how to do the calculation, that's a pretty easy question. So my goal is always not for this stuff to look familiar to you guys. I want it to look easy. When you're in the test center, I want you to be like, uh, I got this. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? I have a question. Yes. So I was looking at the low frequencies and high frequencies you showed uh, like at the beginning and mm -hmm. how STC relate mainly at the middle frequency. What yep. if like you have a building in an airplane zone? So how do you prevent the sound from coming in into the building? So the seal, the roof would be what STC like? Um, right. That's a good question. The, um, so what I did for, these are walls, but what I did, which frankly I don't think I've never seen anyone else do uh, in, the, in, the, in the acoustics world or the architecture world, is for um, assemblies that have especially weak low frequency, I circled their low frequency. So I circled both if either one of these is weak. So mm -hmm. if you would have airplane noise outside, you would not want any of those walls that I circled. Likewise, yeah. Uh, for the ones that have um, really robust low frequency um, um, uh, resistance, I put a square around them. So you can go through the book and just pick some. If you had mechanical noise, transportation noise, or electronic amplification, you would just, you wouldn't even look at the ones, even the ones that have a high STC, you wouldn't look at them if they don't have a high low frequency. So that's kind of how you do it. Now, in reality, you hire an acoustical consultant in those situations, okay. and the acoustical consultant we'll do some calculations. So they'll take measurements uh, at your site that's near the airport of the airplanes going overhead. Um, and <clears throat> they'll hopefully do a lot of them because airplane patterns, aircraft patterns are different at different times of the day. You know, sometimes they have them taking off to the north, sometimes to the east, whatever. Um, but um, uh, so you'll find some of the louder airplanes and then you'll, um, you'll use that as your source. And you'll run, you'll have the source up here. You'll establish the noise criteria as was per the previous question down here. And you'll know that your noise reduction has to be 
enough to get it down. And it has to be enough to get it down at each octave band, which is yeah. crazy, mm -hmm. but it has to be down at each octave band. So basically it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a spreadsheet that you are more than capable of doing, but without a lot of experience doing it, you're probably going to make a mistake doing it, but it's not so sophisticated. And, and this is the thing, if any of you guys have worked with acoustical consultants before, they sometimes make you feel like you couldn't possibly understand what they're doing. Like what they're doing is so magic, you couldn't possibly understand it. In reality, you absolutely could understand it in almost every circumstance. I mean, at the level of a concert hall, probably not, but at the level of almost everything else, you have the wherewithal as an architect with a little bit of training um, to uh, do what they're doing. And in fact, you have skills that they don't because I have found often that acoustical consultants are not able to think in three dimensions. So they, you know, they're not, they kind of miss the floor ceiling assembly because they're focused on the wall or they, when they're thinking about sound moving around the room, they kind of can't really see the double bounce at what, you know, where the X, Y, and Z are all changing at the same time in a way that architects can. So I teach a class uh, every couple of years here for architects called uh, advanced architectural acoustics. I often also have some engineers in that class and, um, and uh, the architects are very good at doing acoustics. You guys, th those people shouldn't make you feel stupid. They're just doing that to justify uh, the, the, the high fees they command. And so you should ask them if you can, you know, explain to me what you're doing. It, 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 trust me, you're going you're gonna to be surprised at how, how straightforward it is. It can be tedious, but it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Anybody else? I see. Can you hear me? I can. I can. Okay. I see there are a lot of details, you know, the more uh, layers you use or more insulation, you know, it's, uh, it, it's working better. But my question is, as per the cost uh, perspective, like what would be the most cost effective uh, solution that mm. if I want to make uh, the, you know, to room like you know have not you know not too much sound going in and right. then, so what would be the best uh, detail to use oh that is really difficult because it depends i mean if if they're pouring concrete anyway in your building then con then having a concrete wall is may not be that 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 expensive because they're already putting foam work and they're already being bringing punch concrete trucks if it's a stick belt building, then obviously, you know, pouring concrete and having support for that concrete underneath the wall um, uh, is going to be quite expensive. And then you're bringing all this moisture into a wood building and that while it cures and so forth. So that's probably difficult for me to, to answer. I will say that generally drywall is not that expensive. Um, and I will also say that um, I was talking about structurally discontinuous. Um, things like double studs. Well, it turns out, we saw over here, we saw the resilient channel. It turns out if you use uh, thin gauge metal studs, uh, something thinner than, you know, 22, 22 gauge or thinner. And remember, with, with metal, a higher gauge means a thinner metal. So 22 or higher. Um, uh, kind of the floppier metal studs, which are less expensive, presumably, uh, the better they actually perform from an acoustics point of view. So um, that's one way to save is you can use metal studs, um, floppy metal studs. Um, there's, a, um, a, the, again, the least expensive way is just, you know, a lot of times you'll see people will put like a conference room and a mechanical room, right? But the building needs to have a closet anyway. So having a conference room and a storage closet and a mechanical room um, is just infinitely better. And then you don't have to worry about anything. Like literally, you almost, you know, in the same way you almost never, uh, you know, can hear the apartment two doors down or the hotel room two doors down, but you can often hear the apartment or hotel next room next door, same principle. So if you can kind of separate, if you can separate those, that's by far the cheapest way. And it happens to be the most effective. The only reason it's not done and you're totally capable of doing it. The only reason it's not done is because when people are laying out buildings, they rarely are thinking about, uh, about noise. But if you, kind of, um, if you kind of mentally or even, you know, with post-it notes, different color, po as you're kind of laying out, if, depending on how you do your space planning, if you have different color post-it notes for the different rooms 
uh, some for the quiet rooms, some for the noisy rooms, and some for it doesn't matter, or you know, or in between or something, then you just want to make sure that your noisy rooms are far away from your quiet rooms. That's by far the cheapest. And then also drywall is pretty inexpensive, um, I think. Although, you know, I was just at a construction site. In fact, you may, during the course of these, be hearing backup beepers all the time. <laughs> um, the irony is not lost to me that I'm talking about acoustics while there's a construction site uh, down the street. And that construction site, uh, I go to it all the time. Sometimes I'm invited, sometimes I sneak in with my hard hat <laughs> and my, um, my boots and my, um, my safety vest, I just sneak in. Uh, with my camera and so I take photos of those all the time so in a couple of years there'll be lots of uh, lots of 40 minutes of confidence and, and probably some architecture uh, videos in the Amber book that have to do with that so it, the irony is not lost on me although you, you know it, it, you could be forgiven if it's lost on you that that's what you're hearing um, but generally uh, generally when we're talking about uh, when we're talking about um, keeping sound out in practice uh, we're talking about where you orient windows, um, uh, how, uh, uh, what rooms you uh, put next to what rooms, um, just something as simple as like where to put the mechanical room. There's no way you should be putting a mechanical room anywhere without considering noise. Something that's loud like that, it will always cause problems because it will cause problems not only in airborne noise from the mechanical room noise going through to the conference room, um, but also there are going to be really loud machines here that are hooked up to ducts and your conference room is going to have air conditioning and so if you have your your uh diffuser or register for your mechanical room for your for your uh, air handling unit it only went you know eight feet between the the fan there's only eight feet of duct between the fan and the register in your room and so it's going to be really loud no matter what the wall is but if however you put the bathroom and the storage room, and uh, some of these, and maybe a corridor, uh, all these other things you have to do, and then you put your conference room over here, then if your mechanical room is here, you want it to go over, you want the ducts to go over all these rooms where noise doesn't matter, like storage rooms and bathrooms and, and corridors and um, gymnasiums and kitchens, and you want it to go over all those, and you want your mechanical room to be really far away, uh, from your um, uh, from your you know your classroom because um, because uh, uh, because not only are you afraid of airborne noise through the walls uh, but that you can take care of with just one room in between but you're also afraid of mechanical noise and I will say that probably there's probably of all the different areas of uh, acoustical consulting so I'm including rain noise and recording studio specifics and uh, and electronic reinforcement, like you know, what type of loudspeakers to put in, and uh, whether or not there's excessive reverberance or acoustic defects like echoes, or um, or uh, uh, speech privacy, uh, like for an office, or speech security, like for an office where there's really sensitive things being discussed, and on and on and on. Of all of those put together, are probably only not as many complaints as the mechanical noise coming through. And most of that is the mechanical noise coming down the duct, the duct that's very short, and going to going to the room. So if, if there's kind of one takeaway of all this, it's put the mechanical room far away, and that way, automatically, no matter what the mechanical engineer lays out, however he, he or she lays out the duct, it, you're going to have a lot of duct between your, your, your source and your receiver. Hey, Mike. Yes. Uh, First, thank you very much for all you're doing for these 40-minute uh, sessions. Much appreciated. Um, oh, it is my pleasure. Thank you. Um, my question, and one thing that always bothered me, and it actually even surprised me at the beginning when I learned it, that uh, sound travels much faster um, in water than, than air. Like, it travels in air much slower than any others. Uh, materials and it's still bothering me uh, it bothers you that it happens or it bothers you like how the hell could that be yeah logically i can't <laughs> right. get that through right so what happens with sound as i'm speaking um there are um my my in my throat i have a uh, i have a, a, a vocal cord and that vocal cord is moving back and forth back and forth and so if i kind of slow it down you may even be able to hear each time it's being kind of plucked. So if I go like, uh, 
you may be able to hear it depending on how good the microphone is at picking that up. Um, and if I go really fast, ee, then obviously you can hear each individual back and forth, but it's going back and forth. And what's happening as it goes back and forth is it's pushing molecules into molecules that are in the air into one another. And those molecules, as they bounce into one another, they're, that, this one bounces into this one, and then this one bounces into this one, and this one bounces into this one, and so forth. And eventually, it gets to your, um, it gets to your eardrum, and your eardrum is sensitive and can sense all those molecules bouncing into it. And that's how you can hear me right now. Um, uh, if you, that's air. If you have water, and I scream underwater, like we all did as children, uh, um, if I scream underwater, the molecules in water, as you might imagine, are much closer together. So the, each, time, each time it bumps, it's like, um, it's like bumping into things that are close together. So you can imagine, imagine two springs. One's kind of pulled apart, and one's kind of stuffed together where it's really tight. So the spring that's kind of pulled apart like this, you can imagine if I push into it, it might take longer um, for it to go all the way to the, for that motion to go to the other end. But if I have another one that's so pushed together and a spring that's so pushed together um, that it almost acts as a rod where the molecules are so pushed together or the, you know, the coils are so pushed together, you can imagine that if I pushed into it um, on the other, if it acts as a rod right away on the other end, they're going to feel it. There's not going to be any delay. So uh, things like steel or water sound moves faster through those because their molecules are closer together uh, because they're just more dense. So is there another, another factor in the uh, equation? So for example, between a space and a space, since sound travels uh, slower in air, I'm not gonna put a partition, let's leave air there. And it, you know, sound will travel slower, so it's better. No, um, uh, because it really doesn't, from the point of view of, uh, from the point of view of uh, either room acoustics, which is, you know, how you sound in your room to someone else listening in the same room, or from the point of view of any of these other areas I'm talking about, whether it be uh, sound isolation, like we're talking about, or mechanical noise, it really doesn't matter how fast the sound gets there. Um, it's the fact that it comes. And it comes, you know, and they're both fast. I mean, you know, from the point of view of the human, um, they're still both pretty fast. Um, the bigger, biggest problem, the, the biggest issue, the biggest kind of, from an architectural point of view, the biggest concern that you have with the sound moving faster through some materials than others is in materials with all that density, like steel, um, uh, impact, structure borne noise can move, uh, because it can move so fast, it can actually move quite far away. So there might be a clanking noise in one part of your building and if it's moving through, if it's being generated by something knocking into something else, um, mechanically, like there's actually impact, um, that structure board noise can be carried quite far away because it can move a long distance through steel or something like that where the molecules are packed together because it doesn't lose much of its energy along the way. Um, but in reality, yeah, sound, sound, sound moving, the speed of sound uh, really doesn't matter. And in fact, the speed of sound does change depending on how humid it is. Um, so if you have more, more moisture in the air, the speed of sound will move at a different pace uh, than if there's less moisture in the air. Um, uh, but it really doesn't matter. I mean, the, it does matter, you know, many of my colleagues will tell you, are you kidding? It matters a lot. <laughs> but they're talking about kind of doing research at a totally different level. So they're, you know, they're doing research at the real margins of kind of, you know, how can we make a concert hall sound slightly better? And so they really need to account for the uh, moisture in the air because the sound's going to move at a different pace. Um, or because they just don't want to get sued because there's a condo board that's uh, looking to sue and uh, because there's impact noise issues and they want to they make sure that the acoustician wants to make sure that when they're on the stand, some other acoustician's not going to say, well, did you take the moisture? Did you take the humidity reading when you took your measurements? Because if you didn't, everything is, you know, everything is bogus. Well, that's not true. But you could definitely fool a jury into thinking everything's bogus if you didn't take the moisture reading. So those things are kind of, round, those are rounding errors at best. Yeah, thank you very much. Much uh, understood now uh, that we need to separate the sound speed from the sound transmission and, you know, yes. what we do technically to uh, stop that. Thank you. Exactly.
Anybody else? All right, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. I will see you guys here next week. Um, and I'm not sure this recorded. So <laughs> uh, I'm not feeling very confident. confident. I'm not feeling very competent. Uh, confident. So we'll see. Uh, but there may be a recording of this or there may not. All right. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.